Croiso, Croiso, welcome, welcome to Britain's Hidden History and me, Ross Broadstock. I am reading from Wilson and Blackett, Charters of the Kings, which is probably the most boring book title ever chosen. And it makes the book seem very unappealing, which actually is a very, very exciting and interesting book full of good content. I'm just going to read the pre preface, or the introduction in the front of the book, to give an idea what it's about in their own words. It could be a bit long, so I'm going to go straight in. There's no graphics, so you can just listen and carry about on with their, whatever you're up to. Okay, page five, preface. In this book, we present the evidence, or at least a very vital section of it, of the Dark Age history of Britain. The centre of the stage of these events is South Wales, just as today... London is the fulcrum and pivotal point of the affairs of Britain. This was the territory of the kings, or at least the major dynasty from around 500 BC, <clears throat> the time of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, of Xerxes the Persian emperor, and his wars with the Greeks and the founding of the Roman Republic. The kingdom of South Wales was in Roman times known as Siluria, probably an ancient Welsh word, Estloig, abounding in prospects. From 500 BC well up to 500 AD, most of what is now England lay under undrained marsh and swamp, bushland, and the Welsh terrain of coastal plains and rolling hills was much more attractive to the herdsmen nations of the British, and along their shores and on the hills lived much larger populations. Settlement in England was along the river valleys on the rolling downs and hills of the south. In Wales, the British kings dwelt on their personal land holdings, grazing their herds, philosophising with their druids and bards, worshipping the one God. Theirs was an enlightened society, a civilised and advanced nation with warrior traditions and was fiercely protective of its institutions and customs. Of them, quite naturally, the only records which survive are from Wales, where the kingdom was based and these records, although substantial in number, have generally been misunderstood, misinterpreted, and subsequently neglected. In fact, there has been a barrier between the Welsh records and the rest of the world for many centuries, and this was the barrier of language. The truth of the matter is that the Welsh language has preserved the culture and heritage of the nation down through centuries of oppression and has become a two-edged sword. For centuries, English kings and later parliaments actively attacked the Welsh language in a very determined manner in successive bids to eradicate it. Their legislation was savage, brutal and barbaric, and something which they carefully kept out of their modern history books. As far back as the unprincipled Richard II of England, laws were framed to prohibit any school from operating in Wales, and any child from being educated, the intention being to brutalise the population into ignorance so that they would forget their past and could be more easily controlled. This went on for some 200 years. All courts were to be held in English, with virtually the entire population speaking only Welsh. No office of any sort could be held by a man who did not speak English. At one period, the laws enacted that, whilst Englishmen could marry Welsh women and so inherit lands, no Welshman could marry an Englishwoman in the same way. The natural reaction was to smoulder in revolt and to pass on their legends and culture in the time-honoured way of word of mouth and preservation of old scripts. The Irish were more fortunate having 70 miles of water between themselves and the English London governments, and even the Scots had the advantage of distance between them. And so the language became the symbol of the national struggle for survival. The English Parliament kept up the pressure, for it is an institution which, although often misguided and wrong, has never admitted to a mistake. All through the 19th century they were at it, while their missionaries rushed over all over the world bringing enlightenment to the people in Africa, India and Asia, and the new administrators of empire paid great attention to national and local tradition and culture. In Wales, they redoubled their attempts to kill off the language. They had failed with the matter of eliminating the schools, and the Welsh had finally opened their own. This time the effort was within the schools, 
and the speaking of even one Welsh word was forbidden. Imagine a school in Pakistan, India, Malaya or Africa, where all the parents speak only their native language, as to the shopkeepers, traders, the holy men, everybody, and then the schools speaking only English and only employing Englishmen. That is what they did. So much for Victoria and the Empire in Wales. The same attempt was made to kill off the wearing of the kilt in Scotland, and the same defiant result by the Scots. The system of English only in schools was enforced by punishments. Any child who inadvert inadvertently spoke even one word of their native tongue had a large block of wood hung around his neck, and at the end of the day the child was punished with a beating. This piece of wood was known as the Welsh knot, and the system was vicious and infamous. There is in fact a stark irony between the treatment of the 20th century coloured immigrants into Britain and that meted out to the original ancient inhabitants. There should be no space for criticism in English history books of the bad men of other nations. They overshadow them with their own. So the struggle over the preservation of the language and the culture went on, and over the pressing years it grew much more bitter, and the Welsh became more determined. With the coming of the printing press, books were written in Welsh, and the scholars of the nation wrote more predominantly in Welsh, but they were now locked into a tight circle, for their writings were unintelligible to the men of other European uh, places, nations, and their language was a great, to a great extent prescribed by the London government. The tongue had no place in the courts, the legislature, or anywhere else in the land. Even the towns and villages were being renamed in meaningless English, whereas the original Welsh names had meaning and told the history of the country in their meanings. Welsh learning inevitably became introverted, and with the coming of the 20th century, the age of movement and communication of not only railways, but of radio, motor vehicles, airplanes, television and space satellites, the language inevitably went into decline. The overwhelming need to communicate in a modern world demands that there is a common language, so the very language which for thousands of years has enshrined the nation's culture and heritage became a two-edged short sword, for it now it threatens to isolate its people, not only from others, but also from each other, where fewer speak the tongue and the majority do not. Worse, it threatens a situation where the very history may become distorted and lost, a loss to all the peoples of Britain, and not just to the Welsh. In this book, we present the evidence of several old sources of ancient Welsh records, not the usual medieval, rec medieval record of the North Wales princes, but of the earlier kings of South Wales, and particularly South East Wales. We intend to show how their record has lived on down through the centuries. It can be demonstrated to be consistent, coherent, logical and true, and where proof is occasionally made possible, it is provable as well. Out of all this comes the tale of a warrior society of a heroic age, the age known commonly as that, known romantically as that of Camelot. Though the dis dim mists of time emerges the greatly loved and eternally remembered Arthur, the British king, valiant and unconquerable. It was Arthur who made Britain what it is today, for his victories made certain that the invasions of the migrating German tribes, commonly referred to as the Saxons, whereas they were Angles, Jutes, Frisians, Saxons and others, would not result in wholesale massacres and genocide. Instead, the migration into and across Britain was made slow and less violent. There was no great monster massacre, and the British fleeing west into the mountains, instead, there was a process of infiltration, integration and assimilation. The Saxons eventually dominated what is now England, but there was no Holocaust. The result was a hodgepodge mixture of peoples finally intermingling and intermarrying. In fact, the signs are that the surviving British population outnumbered the militarily dominant Saxons. This means that while the West unquestionably are of the blood descent of the ancient Britons, as was Arthur, so also the people of England carry a very substantial proportion of that same blood in their veins. There was a change of overlordship, leadership and rule in England, but the great slaughter of the British by the new Saxon people never happened. The people of England are therefore in the same way the inheritors of Arthur, who lived in South Wales as present 
kings and queens live at Windsor. They also, therefore, are the heirs and inheritors of the history, the traditions, the culture and the heritage of the British, for there was a time when their ancestors also spoke the same tongue. The ancient triads of the Welsh, in fact, record seven, gr seven great migratory movements into Britain, the fifth, fifth of which seems to be the migration of the people of South Wales from Byzantium or Constantinople around 500 to 450 BC, known as the coming of the dragon. The sixth invasion was that of the Romans in 43 AD, and the seventh and last was that of the Saxons beginning around 375 AD and onwards. This mixing and intermingling of the races of, in England we discuss more fully in the origins of Arthur. Uh, not sure what book that is. What it really means is that the Englishman has to do what a Welshman does. When a Welshman sees the great tomb cairns piled high on the hills of Glamorgan above Margam and all through the central area, he knows that they are the tombs of the kings of his ancestors. Just as an Egyptian knows that the old pharaohs built the pyramids, now the Englishman has to relearn to say, our ancient ancestors built this, when he views Stonehenge and Avery, that some other bygone or previous people did the job, for only along parts of the south coast and in Kent were the stories of the elimination of the indigenous British population true. In Wales, the preservation of Welsh place names has meant the preservation of the signposts and indicators of the history of the country. And it is not enough to tell people in Britain as a whole that these, along with the language and culture, should be preserved. It is necessary to tell them the reasons why, and it is necessary to tell them that this heritage belongs also to them, although they not, do not speak one single damn word of the tongue, and neither can they pronounce it. Neither of the joint authors of these books speak Welsh. We do it all the hard way, using dictionaries, translations, and so on. To us, the language has done its job and fulfilled its function. What it must not do is be a cause which divides and differentiates between people, neither Welsh people from each other, nor from the English and others. In this book, we have arranged and presented a group of well-known, well-authenticated and genuine manuscripts. We have arranged them into their proper order for the first time and explained them. We have interpreted them correctly by correlating and putting them into a correct timescale to tell the story of the British kings of South Wales, and to identify the elusive and magnetic King Arthur. These ancient documents form a very vital and important part of the history of the Dark Age Britain, and if they are properly explained and fitted into the proper context of the Arthurian Age, then we can begin to understand ourselves and what we are today. The production of this book has been the result of concentrated hard work and dedication regardless of the odds. All approaches to any and every one of the official offices of bureaucrats in Britain resulted in completely negative and obstructive responses for the inept, incompetent, useless, spineless, time-saving, parasitic breed of idle and scrupulous, cynical little men. For example, the Arts Council gave a quarter of a million pounds to make a film about the problem of black youth in South London, yet they had no funds at all to spare for this vital British project. We have used all our own money and resources. And that's the end of that part. Just to point out, this is written back in this is published back in 1981. This is written back in the 70s. And I have to say, sadly, all the things they say have come to pass and got worse. And there is still no official backing or support or interest in working out what real British history is. It's a strange world we live in and bizarre, but there's lots more in this book. I'm going to pick out some more uh, uh, little nuggets to share with you over the next uh, well next few weeks, months, whatever. So until the next time, peace to you all, which is Heather. <laughs>